thank you all again for being here. I know that um, it's a challenge to be here on a snowy night. I think I'm the only person in Boulder who didn't know it was going to snow today. Uh, I was literally driving down the diagonal this morning when there was a snow plow on the shoulder, but it wasn't yet snowing, and I was like, why? Why? Yeah, so miss that one. My husband's a landscaper, so he keeps me informed of the weather all the time, but he's out of town this week, so we miss this one. Um, yeah, so it is my pleasure to welcome all of you here. Um, I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction to the work that we do um, as a team. I'm going to be setting the context this evening for who are the bilingual learners who are learning, uh, who are in our public schools today. Um, and after I set the, the stage, Kathy's going to come up and give you a case study look at a particular student who might be misinterpreted as being very limited, uh, but Depending on the theoretical lenses we use, there are ways to look at these kids and see, as Lori mentioned, um, the positive that they bring to what we do. So one of my favorite authors is Eva Hoffman. She's the author of Lost in Translation, and she has a quote that I always like to use. What she says is, when I speak Polish now, it is infiltrated, permeated, inflected with English in my head. One language modifies the other, crossbreeds with it fertilizes it. Each language makes the other relative. Like everybody, I am the sum of my languages. And so with that, we thought we'd open by letting some students speak for themselves. Yeah, I'm Mika. I am American. Your language is Spanish. I am American. Je parle français, anglais et espagnol. I am American. 我讲中文和英文,我是,I'm American. Learn English, Tamil, Telugu, Madla, Telugu, and American. In a, English, in a, in a, American. In a, in a, I'm American. Me, Hindi, I'm English, Botalu, I am American. Man, English, Siva, Farsi, Harf, Nizanam. I am American. I am American. I English. I am American. For best English, Portuguese, I am American. I am American. Anything English, I am American. I am an American. I am American. I am American. I am American. I am American. Yes, Hosulam Hayeden, Yavanglen, and I am American. Mumyam Pang Yasku, Ifa Bosku, I am American. Turkshan, Indonesian, Kodashiara, I am American. Me, Marathi, Ani, English, Bolto, I am American. Mahan Kahala, Indrisa, Ia, Somaliga, I am American. 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 I'm not backing into Arabic when I, and I and I'm American. So how do you watch that and not smile, right? These children are just some of the more than 10 million children who speak a language other than English who are in U.S. public schools today. And while there are more than 400 languages spoken, as represented by some of what you saw here this evening, more than 80% of them speak Spanish as their other language. And so we're very unapologetic for the fact that the work we do really looks at the intersection of English and Spanish and tries to examine how we might re-look at educating our bilingual learners who speak Spanish and, and English in ways that they don't have to sacrifice a language in order to acquire a second language. So why is that important? Well, from studies that bilingual individuals have an improved ability to attend to important information. They're able to filter out the extraneous. We also know that compared to people who only speak one language, Bilingual learners are better at multitasking. They have increased executive functioning. We also know from a purely economic standpoint that they tend to gain between 5 and 20% more over the course of their lifetime than people who are monolingual. 
And recent studies have shown that while it doesn't prevent Alzheimer's disease, it does delay the onset for five to six years. And for that, some of us who are getting up there are pretty darn happy, right? That at least it's not coming anytime soon. Aside from just these research-based um, advantages, we also know that this is a fundamental part of children's identities and that we need to do what we can to maintain that for them and to help them understand the value in what it is they bring to our schools. So of course we want this for our children. Of course we want this for ourselves. We just need to remember that the only way you get these benefits is if you regularly use two languages. So if they're not being used on an ongoing basis, one language ends up being forfeited. But important to our work also is recognizing that just because we have 10 million bilingual learners, we make some assumptions that sometimes aren't true about them. So if you look at this slide, which takes place back in the year 2000, what it shows you is that 19% of the kids in our schools in the year 2000, right, this is 15 years ago, were bilingual learners. That number is now up to 21%, and it's expected to be 25% by the year 2020. But if you look at the two, two lines underneath, they're really critical too. So of the 19%, 14% of them were born in this country. These are not immigrant children. They may be the children of immigrants, but they are born in this country. They are born into a life where they are exposed to processing and using two languages, likely from the day they were born. Right? So we often joke about the mother who gives birth and says, ay, que lindo, que precioso, right? and the doctor who says it's a boy, right? So from day one, we are seeing that kids are exposed to two languages. This is really different than what we expected even 10, 15 years, you know, 20 years ago. Our bilingual programs were once designed for children for whom they really had one language and it wasn't English when they entered our schools. Our kids now are more simultaneous bilinguals born into a world of two languages. So what does that mean? Sequential bilingualism is an early model of bilingualism in which we design schools so that kids would learn to read and write in one language, likely Spanish, up until some particular magic point at which point we transferred them into English or another language. And we left English or the Spanish behind. We didn't make very many explicit connections for kids so that they could understand what they were learning in schools. Um, and it was more about acquiring English than becoming bilingual. And that may have made a lot of sense for kids who are immigrants who came with one strong language, but these aren't the kids we have in our schools anymore. So part of what we've done with Literacy Squared is start rethinking who are the kids in our school and how can our schools better serve them. Again, these are kids we, we now talk about as simultaneous bilingualism. And so rather than working on theories of transfer, we're now looking at theories of holistic bilingualism. How can we help kids to become fully biliterate and bilingual? How can we help them to know how one language modifies and is a resource for the other? And so I use this image to say it's a lot like when we use our electronic devices, right? If I go into my iPad and I access information, it doesn't mean I can't access it on another device or it doesn't change the other device, right? Um, if I am communicating in one language, it doesn't mean that the information I learned in another language isn't accessible to me. So how do we help kids to make sense of that? I'm aware of the time, so I'm moving rather quickly. But what I'd like to do now is invite Kathy up to talk through a particular child in looking at his work and thinking through, if we look at him as um, two monolinguals in one, which is how we thought about sequential bilingual kids, versus holistically in bilingualism, how does that change our interpretation of that child? Okay, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I have um, the honor of kind of talking about this little uh, guy who we call Manuel. Um, and of course, that's not his real name. But I, I, <clears throat> I wanted to start by saying, um, adding to what Sue was saying, the, what we call the, the work that we have out there about bilingualism and the bilingual brain um, is so compelling and it is so um, comprehensive that it, it, um, it's what we call the gift that keeps on giving. You simply cannot pick up an article about anything, aging, young children, anything that doesn't say that bilingualism is a good thing. Now, contrast that 
to where we are in public schools, um, where we frequently think that kids who come to school not speaking English have a barrier or a handicap or something that they have to overcome. And that's kind of where we were when we started this study. I wanted to add to what Sue was saying, too, about the number of kids being born here in elementary school is upwards of almost 60% of all of the kids who enter school being somewhat limited in English are kids who were born in this country. And it's not just that they um, are they're U.S. citizens, but it's likely that they have gone to preschool where English maybe was the medium of instruction, or to Head Start places where English was the medium of instruction. And they come to kindergarten, and likely um, we hear people say things like, well, they really don't know English or Spanish. They're limited in both of their languages. So such is the case with little Manuel. He was a, he is um, a student, I hope still in school, um, but he was from one of our early, early studies, and I just found his writing sample to be very compelling and to be representative. I'm going to place him in a context of the, the larger work that we do. He was in the fourth grade in 2008 and 2009, and the writing sample is a part of our research um, that we collect. We ask him to write about if you could be somebody else for a day, who would you be? And so um, this is his sample, and you know, when you get to be my age, it's bilingual, biliterate, and bifocals. So um, I apologize, I'm gonna try my best to, 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 to read this to you. Okay, so um, what he says is, if, if, if he could be someone for a day, I would be Juan Carlos. I would be him because he's proficient in math. I was mostly the dumbest kid, but as the year went by, I got smarter. Now I'm back to where I was all over again. I really hate that because I'm really stupid. Plus, I'm partially proficient in math, and Juan is proficient in math, and I am unsatisfactory in reading and writing. Him, too. <laughs> but he's a lot smarter than me. I'm the stupidest in the whole entire school. That's the truth. I haven't told anybody this. I haven't told a soul. Now, there's other work in here to be done, obviously, about testing and what we're doing to kids. But um, when he came to school, he was one of those children that everybody said, we don't know what to do with him. He doesn't seem to know English very well, and he doesn't seem to know Spanish very well. Consequently, by the time he was in the fourth grade, and we collected this writing sample, he had been in and out of the school's version of bilingual education. Um, he started in English, and then they put him in Spanish, and then they put him back in English. And so by the time he's in fourth grade, now um, there's a lot to this kid to like. <laughs> I mean, he knows how to read the walls of the school where all the testing results were hung. Um, by the chimney with care, no. Uh, here, so here he is. Here's, here's little Manuel. Um, he, um, again, was in the, he was a fourth grader. He was born in the U.S. He had been in U.S. school since the time that he was in preschool. So his preschool years were in English. He came to kindergarten and people said, we don't quite know what to do with him. But you will see in 2009, uh, when we took the writing sample, his CELA score, which um, the, the WIDA, the access test, has now replaced CELA, but CELA was a test that kids took so that we could decide if they were proficient enough in English to not be required to have bilingual education or English as a second language. So his CELA score was four, um, and I don't have the slide and I don't have his eighth grade, but his eighth grade score was exactly the same as his fourth grade score uh, when I went back to find him a few years later. Um, in the spring of 2009, now he's a fourth grader, EDL and DRA are informal writing assessments, and at the end of first grade, um, a benchmark score of 16 is thought to be what you need at the end of first grade. So here's a fourth grader with a Spanish score of four and a DRA score, an English score of 12, and you can see why teachers at his school were saying he's low in both languages. His reading is, in fact, low in both languages. His writing sample, um, was judged by some to be unreadable. So when you get judged as unreadable, then you, you don't get the next step. And the next step is, what writing intervention do we need to help you? It's just sort of concluded that you don't know how to write, so we need to start from the, the beginning. Um, this, is hard, this is hard for me to talk about, but um, we need to talk about, because like I said, the contradiction between all of the, the work about the benefits of bilingualism was kind of lost um, on this particular child. So on the right side were all of the prescriptions um, that he was getting, uh, being given for what would make him a better reader and writer. 
but you will see that the talk at his school about him was, was pretty deficit in its orientation. And even if we talk about bilingualism as a benefit, he didn't have the right kind of language, which is something called academic language. And that, that's just pervasive in the school. So um, I want to say this. From the time that he was in school, because, because of the um, prescription that he didn't know English or Spanish very well, he got a series of interventions, which meant from kindergarten through the fifth grade, he never got science and social studies, not once. And that really came back to haunt him when he hit middle school. Um, that was one more he doesn't have and he doesn't know that was placed upon him, when in fact he never had an opportunity to learn either of those subject areas. Okay, so here's Manuel's school. I'm trying to contextualize him. It would be nice, it would still be tragic if Manuel were a case study. Manuel was not a case study. He was representative of the majority of kids in his school and the majority of kids who carried the label English learners in the school district. Now, um, when we first started uh, Literacy Squared, we asked people, well, what do you think? Um, they would say things like, well, he doesn't know, they don't know English or Spanish very well. It would be different if they had their first language intact and well developed, but they don't. So that was one thing we heard. Another thing we heard is the kids move around a lot. Well, the kids in this particular school, there was less student attrition than there was teacher attrition and administrator attrition. So the kids were the stayers. And that was true the whole first phase of Literacy Squared. Um, every single one of our principals turned over, 40% of our teachers turned over, and only 10% of the kids moved. So that whole idea that there's a lot of mobility of kids just it wasn't true. Um, there were 420 kids at this school, 75% of them carried the label Latino, 70% carried the label English language learner, 87% of them were poor kids on free and reduced lunch. Um, the school rating at this particular year was orange, and I need to say this, um, uh, because we work closely with teachers, I mean, we, we, um, we root for them. We hope to pick up the paper and see blue or green or something. Um, but this year, orange was like cause for dancing in the street because red is the lowest rating. So they like, they weren't red. So it was like everybody went out for margaritas. Okay, so, uh, but the, again, the diagnosis, if you will, and I know I'm using a lot of medical terms, was that the kids in our school lack academic literacy, and it's because neither their English or their Spanish has been very well developed. Um, so that is representative of the entire school district. So it's not just Manuel, his school, it's the school district where upwards now of 40% of the kids are English learners, and one third of all of the schools who are low performing in the entire state are in this particular school district. So. Um, as we go on, like I said, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is in our particular study, Manuel was one of many. He's a case study, but he represents uh, many. I, I'm also cognizant of the time. So I'm going back, here's what he wrote. Um, and he was, one of our, our research colleagues says, you have, to, you have to read this, and this has gotta be your whole AERA paper. I don't care what else you say, but this, you gotta sneak this in there. Okay, so when we ask, so the, what uh, our study does is we collect writing once a year, we invite teachers and we all score the writing samples together and we talk, we don't just score them for a numeric score, but we score them looking at what, what can we do for this child, what can they do. Absent in the first part of our study was any kind of, um, here's what the child can do talk. And um, so we heard things like, this is unreadable, so of course he got an unsatisfactory score. Um, this is not writing, this is a random string of letters. I will argue this was not a random string of letters. Um, that he doesn't have fine motor control of his writing, and I would say that there's something to that, but largely he'd been learning to read and not learning to write on top of not getting science and social studies. Um, that he was lacking in strategies, which is where the bilingual ideas come in. He's not lacking in strategies. He's using strategies from both of his languages. And that he was in need of special help. But at the end of fourth grade, he was staffed into special education, which I'm not sure was a, a, the right thing to do. Uh, but there was no discussion in the discourse of what he could do. And, um, and so I want, to, I want you to see the prescription uh, for him. Um, that approximations like Juan Carlos, uh, and him for him and really for really and again for again indicate a need for more intensive phonemic awareness instruction, um, which is basically what he had had for the previous five years. 
So the, the idea for what we should do for him, to him, with him, um, choose your pronoun, um, was more of what he had already had. Um, approximations of words like proficient might indicate the need for more phonics or spelling. But notice the words he could use, partially proficient and proficient. He could use all the nomenclature of the CSAF, which was a pretty amazing. Approximations for words like back and uh, by might indicate Spanish interference. And I'm putting Spanish interference there because it was seen as Spanish getting in the way of English. And all of the above are necessary before we can look at the content of what he wrote, which to me was one of the more serious things that... Um, that together I think we needed to talk about. And these were all considered to be data-driven observations. Okay, so if we were to write what he wrote in a more standard way, um, this is what it might look like. And I might say what, um, what our team thought about this. So first of all, we said, he's got a strong voice. My goodness, you know, when he can even use literary language. I haven't told a soul. I'm the stupidest kid in the whole school, and I haven't told a soul. Well, that's, that's darn good. Now, could he write it conventionally? No. But his, that, we can, that we can do. He's got ideas. Um, he knows how to express himself in complete thoughts. He didn't have the conventions to tell us he, it was a complete sentence. Um, he used sophisticated phrases and vocabulary. His spelling I'm, is not Spanish interference but utilization of multiple strategies that come from both of his languages. So um, when he wrote things like Juan Carlos with the HW, that doesn't exist in Spanish. That, he didn't get that from Spanish. He put that together from somewhere else. Most of the errors that he made are rule governed and not, are not random. And I would argue that he's quite aware of his status in the school. Um, so we you know, kind of concluded this is a pretty amazing kid that's not being given much credit for what he knows and can do. And so now um, Lucinda's going to talk, and I, I didn't mean, together I think with the, the teachers that we've worked with, we've grown to respect and love each other, and we have people bringing this up, watch with this kid, what do you think about this? Can you read this? And so where we, where we used to have the non-readable, we're now like we bend over backwards before we give up on trying to, to figure out what a child is trying to tell us when they're writing. And so Lucinda's going to tell you now more about Literacy Squared. So good evening, buenas noches. Um, I'm going to talk about Literacy Squared and the work that we've been doing to serve children like Manuel and uh, the simultaneous bilingual children that nowadays represent the new normal in our public schools. So when thinking about um, the diversity in our audience tonight, I thought that you would be most likely interested in learning about uh, key uh, instructional components of Literacy Squared. So I will do that. But I, I, would also, I will also share what we've learned over the course of 10 years of implementing this uh, project in schools uh, throughout the country. So, um, Literacy Squared has, I, I would just uh, give you quickly uh, an, an overall idea of the components of the project. So, it is based on a conceptual foundation of simultaneous bilingualism. And we, are, we have a research agenda to support and to validate the biliteracy model that we are implementing. We also have a professional development program for leaders in school districts and leaders in uh, schools and of course practitioners who are interested in implementing our ideas. We, uh, we have developed assessment systems, bilingual assessment systems to build what we call trajectories towards biliteracy and I will say some more about that in a little bit. And of course we have a, an instructional component which is a comprehensive biliteracy framework. I would like to start by um, talking about what's unique about Literacy Squared. Its core elements are represented here in this visual. You see uh, the two circles represent instruction in Spanish and in English. And uh, these two language environments are purposefully connected. That's uh, the arrow in, in the center. 
And within each language environment, we encourage teachers to give equal attention to all the different uh, literacy domains, uh, reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and also meta-language, which is the ability to talk about language. And we also give explicit attention to making cross-language connections, which is represented with the circular arrows in, um, in the outside. <coughs> I have to say that um, currently reading instruction programs or uh, literacy curriculum for emerging bilingual children in the country over the last decades has most, have mostly focused on reading with, with some attention to writing, but there are other critical aspects in literacy development that have not been considered. And so our, we are proposing this broader view of literacy in two languages where those language domains, again, listening, speaking, reading, writing, and meta-language are integrated in a holistic um, learning environment. So um, as Sue mentioned at the beginning, a common misconception uh, about bilingualism is that children need to first develop a strong foundation in their home language before they can learn uh, to read and write in another language. In our context, uh, that, that would be um, English. And so this is what, what it's called sequential um, literacy programs, where English literacy instruction is delayed, and then instruction in the home language is discontinued after uh, the children have uh, reached a certain uh, proficiency level in, in English. Now, these sequential bilingual approaches may be appropriate for the immigrant children from 15 years ago. You remember the graph that, uh, that Sue showed um, earlier. However, these models, these approaches, no longer uh, serve well our simultaneous bilingual uh, kids who are US born and who come to school with an emerging knowledge of two languages. So we need, we need new, new models. We need new models to, uh, to mirror the strengths and also the needs of these uh, simultaneous bilingual children. And one of these models is paired literacy, uh, which we have adopted in, um, in Literacy Squared. So um, what exactly does paired literacy mean? So simply put, I have um, two images there. So um, pair literacy, uh, the main concept is that children can learn to read and write in two languages from the start without being confused. So English literacy is not delayed until second or third grade, like usually happens <laughs> in bilingual programs. And uh, instruction in their native language is never discontinued. So uh, they learn to read and write in two languages from the beginning as symbolized in the two open uh, lane road on the picture on, on the right. And, uh, and, and this happens from, uh, from kindergarten and continues through, uh, through the upper grades. So this idea of pair literacy challenges the notion of strictly separating the, the, the two languages for instructional purposes. This happens very often um, in English medium programs. For example, in schools that offer ESL services or in English immersion programs where there is no room, no role for the student's home language for instructional purposes. But it also happens in bilingual programs where instruction in the two languages is compartmentalized and so schools have curriculum, one curriculum for Spanish, a different one for English. And uh, students and teachers are expected to stay in the, in the language of instruction um, in turning off the other language. The expectation is that in order to avoid confusion, children must stay um, in one language, when in fact, um, as, as you mentioned earlier, bilinguals do 
think and process information across languages, even when they can communicate in one language and they know when uh, they have to do it, but they also know when and with whom they can communicate in, um, in their two languages. This is represented here, the, um, the strict separation of languages. Cross-language connections, the other image there, um, is an innovative idea that not only supports children to apply what they know in one language to learning in the other language, but it also gives teachers the pedagogy to connect the two languages strategically and purposefully. So these, this cartoon here, um, is that an alarm that my time is up? <laughs> okay, so this cartoon is by Hector Cantu. His, um, his characters are Latino. So this illustrates this idea of the strict separation of languages that we live um, not only in school settings, but um, in, in the society at large. So here there is Baldo, his name is Baldo. He is in the ATM and he is asked to select his language, right? So the options are Spanish or English. So he looks puzzled, right? And when he goes to his car, his, his father says, Baldo, where's my money? And he's like, well, I don't know. The machine broke down on me. And all I did was to press two buttons at the same time. So, like Baldo, many of our simultaneous bilingual children live and learn in, in environments where there is no space for simultaneous bilingualism. Um, the assumption is that they cannot have their two languages activated and um, when, when in fact we know that um, learning and processing of information happens across languages. So in practice, these uh, two big ideas that I, I, I just mentioned of pair literacy and cross-language connections are implemented in, um, in practice in classrooms by encouraging children to make connections between their two languages. So it's one of the strategic methods that uh, is presented by, uh, in Literacy Square to purposefully plan opportunities for children, like in, 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 uh, shown in this chart, to compare similarities and differences between their two languages. This is an, uh, uh, a chart that was developed in, uh, in one of our um, schools here in Boulder, uh, where the teacher and the kids are talking about the differences between Spanish and English with regards to um, adjective placement, for example, and notice the use of color coding. Uh, to highlight that, conventions for writing titles and, um, and the use of, of punctuation. So it involves the explicit contrast between two languages with regards to uh, grammatical rules, punctuation, the use of idiomatic expressions, etc. Um, successful bilingual children do not compartmentalize their languages. However, they do need to become aware of how what they know and can do in one language can support and advance their learning in the other language. This may not happen automatically for some children, and so one of the goals of pair literacy within uh, Literacy Squared is, um, is to make these connections explicit for children and do that as early as possible. These will benefit them, and they would not need to relearn the skills that they have learned in one language when, uh, when learning in the other language. So it makes instruction more effective. Here's another um, example. It's a cognate chart. Cognates are words in two languages that have um, the same uh, etymological root, so from, from Greek or Latin. And so they have a similar meaning, but they may be different in the pronunciation and also in the spelling. So this, this also, um, comes from a literacy square lesson in a, in a classroom where uh, the teacher and the kids are comparing uh, cognate pairs and highlighting again the, the differences to, to help children uh, become aware of that. Okay, so now literacy squared has touched over 5,000 children and over 300 teachers in its almost now 10-year 10, 10 um, history. 
Um, at the beginning, in the first phase of the project, there were we started with uh, schools from four different school districts in, in the state of Colorado and uh, three different school districts in, in Texas. But the program has grown so much that today we are reaching over 5,000 children in uh, three states in about 21 schools. So this is very exciting work that, um, that is happening in, in these schools. Now let, let's move to assessment just briefly. briefly. This image, this visual represents, uh, is a representation of a hypothesis that Kathy and another colleague in the project had um, about how Spanish and English reading should develop. So the hypothesis was that there would be a little bit of a lag um, between the two languages, but not too big. So, um, so English, which is represented with blue, English would be coming right up behind um, Spanish. Um, this also shows that um, the, the impact or the effects of pair literacy instruction is cumulative. So the longer the, the kids uh, receive pair literacy, the less uh, uh, discrepancy in their achievement in their, uh, in their two languages. Now, this, this idea um, became the foundation for the development of uh, what we call biliterate reading and writing trajectories. And these trajectories, after almost a decade of empirical um, data within the project, reflects realistic goals for achieving biliteracy and also for what has become one of our mottos, which is to teach to the students biliterate potential in um, what they can do in their two languages. Um, these are the results of one of our research studies, which pretty much represents the results that we have uh, observed in across our research sites. So uh, there are these three graphs here. <clears throat> um, the bottom represents the grade levels, and then uh, this um, vertical represents the um, reading levels. In, uh, in blue, we have reading levels in Spanish, and in red, the, um, yeah, the outcomes in English. These um, numbers here come from three different cohorts. So the first one was uh, students who were in first grade when literacy squares uh, started to be implemented at their school. And then uh, the next one, the kids were in second grade, and, and the third cohort, the kids were in third grade. So what, what we see is that overall, the results were very positive and show that students made steady growth in both um, languages over, uh, this was a three-year study. Also, generally, when, uh, when looking across cohorts, we see that students who are in literacy squared longer have higher, higher outcomes. So if you look at um, cohort four, the very right, um, the students in third grade, they were performing uh, in, um, in English, the red line, they were performing below benchmark for third grade uh, in, the, in, in this assessment that it's called the DRA. So they were um, below the expected uh, grade level uh, outcome. And then when we compare those kids to kids in, in, the, in cohort three who were in third grade, at, uh, at that time, this kid had, had received biliteracy instruction for a year. The other kids presumably did not have biliteracy instruction um, when, they, when they started in third grade. So notice that the kids who had received biliteracy for a year are performing higher and they are performing at grade level after a year of participation in, um, in the project. So um, to me, the most salient result is that the growth of the reading achievement of um, the children is largest when pair literacy starts early. Here are results for writing, and we see that the, the trends are very similar. 
to the to the results I presented for um, for English. There is a steady growth in both languages, and also um, the longer the students are receiving biliteracy instruction, the less discrepancy we see in their achievement in the two languages, as, as seen uh, in the third year. Also, notice that the Spanish mean scores are generally higher than um, than English, but um, Towards the end, they, they, um, they are comparable, and this indicates that children are um, getting or making greater gains in English literacy. So in other words, by being taught to read and write in two languages, their um, learning of uh, English is being accelerated, while Spanish literacy is, uh, is being maintained. So again, we have the strongest impact when pair literacy starts early, and when it's sustained through the upper grades. So now we would like, do we have time for the video? How, how are we doing with time? Yeah, yeah. so uh, about three, four minutes. Uh, we would like to show you teacher testimonials where you can see uh, what the experiences of teachers who've been implementing the RSC squared are. What I appreciate the most about Literacy Squared is this concept of biliteracy. I think it's a really unique way of thinking about language learning that I, having an ESOL endorsement, have never really been exposed to previously and I think it makes complete sense. I like that we're, that we're having the students read in English and write in English and learn common you know, phrases, common words in their writing. Uh, I think it's great because you know Spanish and English are so similar anyway that it's easy just to build off of each other. Literacy Squared has been fabulous. I love teaching with the strategies that we use. Um, I feel like the kids are learning um, in English and in Spanish um, and it's fun. I've enjoyed teaching it, challenging myself. I like that we're teaching the children at a young age to be biliterate. Um, we're giving them that opportunity. We're not waiting for them to be in a third grade transition to barely start learning their English. Um, I feel that our English this year it has a target. Um, versus when we used Carousel, I still love those pieces. I use them for ESL instruction. But I see the difference and the, the ability as teachers to go ahead and speak both in Spanish and in English during ESL-based instruction because this is what you get from the kids. Oh, yo sabía eso. I knew it. They already knew it. So the difference is them being able to transfer what they already know in English. This gives them a heads up for English. This gets them ready and when they actually see it in English, they'll already know it because they knew it in Spanish. It's just letting them know that you already knew it and they're, own, they're, they're responsible for their own learning process of, of, of transferring. There, there are a lot of um, opportunities to kind of go back and forth between the languages. For example, in, um, one of the strategies is dictado, which is like a traditional dictation that I'm sure they did years ago, and we've kind of walked away from doing that. But they take it one step further and help them start thinking about how we speak and how we um, write and read. And one week we'll do it in Spanish, one week we'll do it in English so that they're getting kind of a variety of both. They've seen it modeled really well in Spanish, and then we take it the next level, doing it in English. We don't use the same sentence because we don't want them translating and, and learning verbatim, word for word, how things go in Spanish versus English, but it gives them the opportunity to look at their writing, look at what they're, they're reading. If they're writing it, they're reading it, um, to kind of take apart the language and think about how grammar works. They haven't inherently learned English grammar growing up speaking Spanish and so they need those opportunities to understand English grammar not just magically figure it out on their own. Uh, one language function will lead to another resource and with Literacy Square we have the ability to keep everything connected and related and it's very powerful for this. Always acknowledging for their progress also in both languages and there is a time that there's no frontier between languages. We can always uh, speak English during Spanish literacy if we need to clarify a concept. Uh, the same when we, it's time to study in English. It seems that the frontier between languages have been completely erased 
and that we are becoming truly bilinguals. Literacy Square helps us meet our biliteracy target zone. So if, for example, right now we're doing conferences, and I tell the parents, you know, your child is here at a Spanish reading grade. In English, they're here. By next conference, I just show them their zones where they should be. But what's nice is during this whole school year, not only will we advance in our Spanish zone, we're advancing our English. So although they might not be hand in hand at the first years, which is kinder and first, we sure are getting them, uh, we're, we're lessening the gap. And that's what we want to create. We want to lessen this gap and create a very slightly undertone or even or, or, or over, right? But that is the whole point of Literacy Square, lessening that gap. I feel that the cross-language connections are probably the most important thing because I, for me, the whole idea of Literacy Squared is to help the students realize that their Spanish language is a resource to them and to use that to help them learn and acquire English. We're always talking on a daily basis of how English and Spanish are so similar and we talk about planning and it does take a lot of time. I definitely think it's worth it. It's worth my time. I see the looks on my students' faces as they're learning. And so for me, it's worth it to put the time into it. It helps to have coworkers that are supporting me and helping me figure out lesson plans that will be effective. And so working together has been, has eased the workload. Um, but I think it's, we're doing a good thing here. And so I'm very excited to see how it all ends. So it's important for teachers to be able to explain what Literacy Squared is about and how they use it and to articulate why what they are doing is important and certainly we see that in this teacher testimonial. So our classroom data, uh, our classroom obser um, observation data and our interaction with uh, leaders in school districts and, and with teachers and certainly the students' uh, literacy outcomes have shown that Literacy Squared has benefited um, teachers and, um, and children alike and that we are promoting this value of bilingualism in their communities. So uh, with that, um, Kathy, let me have Kathy okay. give the conclusion. Do the last slide, yeah. the last slide quickly. Is that what you're saying? Do the last slide quickly. Um, well, so the question is, um, and again, uh, Sue asked me to, to just tell you that in an hour we can't tell the whole story, um, although we, we, we would talk about it for hours and hours and hours if any of you would listen to us, but um, obviously we're working with teachers and with schools um, in service of uh, something that I think is really, really important, which is not just how to teach um, emerging bilingual kids English, but how to make sure that they end up having this gift of bilingualism that we have this outstanding research base that tells us is what, you know, we have English speaking parents lined up at doors of dual language schools to have their children become bilingual and we're worried that kids who don't speak English aren't acquiring English and we're not so worried about the biliteracy. So um, our, we, what we're saying is when you got 10 million kids and some of them are not just the majority, we, we are working with schools where there are no native monolingual English kids in the school. Um, that we need to move the, the conversation about bilingual learners to the center of what we're doing. Um, we need to develop a pedagogy for teaching bilingual learners. Um, this may be different from the one that we've had in the past that's sequential in its notions. What do we do uh, with kids who are coming to school knowing two languages to maximize both of those languages and in instruction? Um, we need to, I think, critically examine and change reductionist frameworks. Um, this whole idea that you don't know any very much English or very much Spanish, so we just need to drop one and quit the other one. Um, or that you can't, we can't read what you write unless you can spell it correctly. So there are lots of reductionist frameworks in schools that we're working with that we're working to change. Um, and then I think that, you know, the policy work is really important, um, but I think we need to, to criticize inappropriate policies such as high stakes testing in only English for when we're not looking at half of what most of the kids that we're working with can do. And so with that, I'm supposed to advance the slide. Um, so we thank you very much, Mi Gracias.